Olá pessoal, bem-vindos a mais um Geração G4, o podcast do G4, da comunidade do G4. E nós estamos aqui diretamente de Ibiúna, no G4 Class, na sétima edição do nosso G4 Class, que é um encontro dos membros do G4 Clube. E hoje tem um convidado super especial, ele que vai ser o nosso Keynote Speaker, que a gente vai ter uma aula com ele amanhã e vai ser uma aula incrível. O nome dele é David Marquet, ele foi capitão da Marinha Americana, ele foi capitão de um submarino do USS Santa Fé, que foi, na época quando ele assumiu, era o pior submarino da, da, do batalhão, e ele conseguiu turn the ship around, ele conseguiu dar uma volta por cima e tornou esse submarino um dos mais condecorados da Marinha Americana. E eu tô com ele aqui hoje para bater esse papo, contar um pouquinho para vocês de como que é um pouco do, dos dois livros que ele escreveu, é, como que foi o estilo de liderança que ele aplicou lá para conseguir essa transformação, mas obviamente eu vou estar aqui conversando com ele em inglês, então... Acompanha aí com a gente, é uma boa hora para você que já tem o um inglês acompanhar aqui. Para você que está precisando aperfeiçoar, fica de olho aí nesse bate-papo que eu vou fazer aqui com o David Marquet. So, David, thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure. It's boa a pleasure. Boa tarde. Boa tarde. <laughs> Very yeah, good. Yeah, so I have to speak in English though because I can't. Speak It's all right. I'll speak English as well. No thank problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure it. to have you here. Uh, we're we're really excited for. Uh, listening to to your talk tomorrow, uh, and we we wanted to to have this opportunity to have you in our podcast as well, so that can, we can have a little bit of a, a broader audience uh, listening some of the insights that mm -hmm. you bring in your book. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, to start, if you can give us a little bit of context on your career and you know how how you got to to write the 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 both books that you wrote. Yeah, so. Uh, I started my career in the Navy as a very good command and control leader. My job was to make decisions. I was the thinker. I was the smart guy. I had a passion for action, a uh, bias for action and get things done. And I did very well. I would tell the team what to do. Most of the time I was right. They would do it. Things went better. They were eh, sort of happy because they were on a winning team, uh -huh. but it was really, it all came from me. And my, as I was successful, I got promoted, the team size got bigger, and then I was, they selected me to be a submarine commander, so it's about 150 people. In one submarine. In one submarine, yeah. It's pretty, it's, it's a pretty big submarine. as nuclear reactor, as three, it's like three decks. Three decks, Three okay. decks. Um, it's, th it's 10 meters circular. Uh-huh. But it, this was your first submarine? No, it was my first as, as the captain. I, I okay. was a submariner. Oh, okay. You, you stay, like, that's your career path. Yeah. I was in submarine. Uh-huh. And at the very last minute, they shifted me to a different kind of sub, to a different submarine. Because the captain there quit. He quit oh. because it was the, doing the worst. Oh, wow. And had the worst morale. And that was the USS Santa Fe. And I thought this was the worst thing that could happen in my life. And it wasn't because it was the worst performing ship with the worst morale. That I was the guy they sent to those kind of places. But I always knew the answer. The problem was on Santa Fe, it was a kind of submarine I'd never been on. So it would be like going from uh, running a bank to r running uh, automobile man manufacturer. Something like that. It was like totally, it felt very foreign and I looked at when I walked on board I looked at the equipment it looks so the first thing I had to do is I had to learn how to say I don't know oh wow and as, I, a, as a captain as a, as a captain right so imagine so I'm I was sent there they know they're the worst ship their captain quit on them and they send this new guy in and the first thing he says is hey I don't know <laughs> <laughs> and we have these hang-ups I had these hang-ups I felt like I needed to show that I knew Mm -hmm. and all the other jobs that I have, but there was literally no way I could do that. It would have been false. It would have been hypocrisy. Dangerous, maybe. And, right? da and dangerous, yeah, because if I tried to tell them what to do, they would have done it. Mm -hmm. they, that's a scary thing. We don't need more compliance. What we need is more thinking. And so I had to sh reshuffle my whole deck about leadership because... M What all my tools, my whole tool belt uh -huh. was about getting them to do what I wanted. It was 
what I decided they needed to do. Every tool was structurally in that type of purpose. It was, I could maybe pretend like it was their idea or tell them nicely or tell them precisely or inspire them, whatever it was, but it was all the same structure. And now, and I was, I, the other thing was, I always felt like I was leaning in and pushing and making things happen. And I was the person who, and now I had to do the opposite. I leaned back. So what do you guys think? What would you do? And that came nat naturally? Or, no, or? my gosh, no, I'm like, ah, no, it was the word. It, no, I wanted to push. I wanted to tell them what to do, but I had to go, oh, well, that sounds like a hard problem. What do you think? Like, if you were me, what would you do? What do you think we should do? And I had to get really good at not giving the answer, even when I thought I knew the answer. And then, uh -huh. and, and partly because I was able to admit, hey, I don't know, hey, show me, what, what, how does this work? Oh, well, this does, and so I started learning the ship very quickly. And then the danger was I started thinking I, would, I was knowing the answer. But mm -hmm. when I stopped telling the team what to do, and they came to me, so I'm leaning back, not like this. Of course. But just gradual, like this. And it happens, like for some people, over a couple of days, for some people, a couple of weeks, a couple of months. But then they started leaning, they're coming to me all day long. Energy's coming to me. Nice. I wasn't exhausted. If I skipped the meeting, didn't make a difference. I just didn't show up, didn't matter. They things, said, things happen. Things that happen without me. And it was kind of scary, but we're also communicating. So that's the thing we get distributed decision making and unity of effort, that's what we call it, uh, where we get everybody moving in the same direction. Mm -hmm. But again, it's always you. You're always a problem. Like I was always a problem. I always wanted to go back. I always felt the urge, oh, I'm doing the right thing when I'm telling people what to do. I'm doing the wrong thing when I'm not telling them what to do. But over the long run, you build a team of decision makers. Yeah. And this is what I say to entrepreneurs who start, they start their company they're, and great, they're successful. They're, they're the thinker and the doer because yeah. it's only them. That's and how we start. That's right? how we start. And that's yeah. right. And that's the right way to do it. And then you're successful. And then I can start to outsource the doing. I start hiring people, but I hold on to the thinking. I'm the decision maker. And your company will be worth more if you do less. If you do less what? If you do less, dis less decision making. Mm -hmm. Because, we, well, you were in um, private equity. When you look at a company, if you say, oh, well, this guy's making all the decisions, the company, is, the value is in the person. Exactly. But if we say, oh, look, what an amazing team. What's that on the best teams on the planet? We say, oh, the value now has moved to the company. You want to be rich or do you want to be rich and do whatever you want? <laughs> like if you're rich, but you're running a company all day long, exactly. you're not really rich. You you're don't not have time wealthy. for anything. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, I have lots of money in the bank. That doesn't help me. Yeah. I want to be able to spend time with my family. I want to be able to go to resorts like this place. <laughs> I, I, I want to go hike mountains. That happens. The people who figure that out have been able to create teams that can run yeah. on their own. That was my big learning. But, but, but it's, I mean, it's hard to, to let go, right? Because we, I mean, there's a number of things, but you know, first we think, I do, I do this better than anyone, right? So I'll tell him to do, and more than that, I'll control yes. how he does. Exactly. Right? And, and, and you know what I feel feeling like we all feel it. Yeah, exactly. And it's counterintuitive, right? To, yeah. to ask him, you know how to do it. Right. But you, instead of telling them how to do it, you ask them, how would you do it? Yes, exactly. Right? And I, I think what you said there is spot on. Everything on the submarine, everything in your company. Mm -hmm. Let's say you got 10 people. Let's say your soul sole founder, so and now you got 10 people. You could probably do everything better than each of those other nine people. Probably. Probably could, yeah. but you shouldn't. Uh -huh. Because then what's gonna happen is you're gonna run around doing all that, you're gonna be exhausted, and you're never gonna get to 100 people. So, you get 
good, I call it long-term lazy. <laughs> long-term, like long-term lazy means I'll do the work today so I don't have to do work six months from now, so I don't have to go chase people around six months or a year, two years, three years from now. So, but I'll do the work today. I'll, and, and the work today means building the structure of how the team communicates and makes decisions, building decision makers. And it's slow and it's frustrating and they come to you with stupid ideas and you gotta pretend to listen. Well, you should actually listen. I loved it. And I always say, when, they, when that happens, it, try to be a poker player. Try to be a say, poker player. Say, in your head, you will say, oh, this is, this is a stupid idea. Yeah. But here's what I want you to do. For one minute, pretend like they're right. And then ask them questions to explore it. Not ask them questions to te- like, well, why would you want to do that? Or how is that going to work? Like, that's not, the, that's not right. It's like, oh, tell me more. That, that's a good question to buy you a little bit of time. Okay, and then like, what would be the, what, how could we test that really quickly? Or what would be the first step? Or what's the first prototype we could build? Uh-huh. Or um, how, let's go, uh, what could, I always say, what can we do tomorrow for nothing? Mm-hmm. And let's get some feedback from some of our clients. Let's just go, let's build a fake website, see what happens. And then, now I know. So now it's not me saying or judging. So I had a comp- one of my clients, is they make uh, baby food uh-huh. in the UK. They're based outside of London. Ellis Kitchen, great group of people. And uh, we were working with them and they wanted to build a place where everyone was participating, thinking, because it's better for the people. They, uh-huh. they are all in. And uh, one day the product group came to the leadership and said, oh, we have an idea for a new product. It's called, a, they call it a melty stick. And it's basically like um, a, a cross between a breadstick uh-huh. and like a pretzel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> for kids, this is for kids who um, are like, their teeth are still coming in. Mm-hmm. So they can kind of gum on it. Okay, yeah. So that's the kind of thing. The problem with the product was you had to get the consistency just right because if it was too too hard, Mm -hmm. then it it would scare the kids. And if it was too soft, it would just kind of melt away. So you had to get it right. And then then, then when you did that, it was kind of fragile. It was basically just a lot of air in this like puffy thing. (laughs) So they were just selling air. Uh, And then, (laughs) but the packaging also, they needed to make like this special... Um, plastic thing where you could sit in, otherwise it would break, so yeah. it's more expensive, blah, 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 blah. And the leadership team was like, ah, this, this is never gonna work for all these reasons, but we've been preaching this empowerment thing, so we gotta let them have a win every once in a while. So they're like, okay, you can do your silly, like we'll spend like, we'll put some money into it and we'll spend, we'll see what, number one selling product. No way. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> melty stick. So you might be wrong. Uh-huh. That's the other thing. Yeah. Y- you might, after all that, you might be wrong. Yeah. But, but I mean, they were wrong and, and it became a, 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 a best-selling product, but they didn't do the exploration that you said, or, they, or, or did they? Well, they came and pitched it. They, 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 when they pitched it to the leadership, uh-huh. they were trying to get company resources yeah. to go to the next step and yeah. actually start building it and, and, and started working. Yeah, then. but you know, we're not going to wage, we're not going to um, put the whole company's future yeah. on this thing. So we're going to take a small amount, we're going to see it, and we're going to do some test samples. And they start having small wins until oh, yeah, they became, wins until they became the, yeah. the, the best selling product. Exactly. That's interesting. So during your, during your, your uh, leadership there, that, that you started, instead of having the answers, because yeah. I, I, I guess that before, uh, your commanding, your command there, the, the, the previous leader had a, a traditional style of telling them what to yeah, do, right? Yeah. How was the, 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 the shift? How was the adaptation from the team? Did they, did they, yeah. did they, did they enjoy it or did, were yeah. they confused? Like, why is he asking me what I, what I would yeah, do, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, So, um, it depends on the person. Uh-huh. 
a lot of people liked it right away. Okay. Because, look, they they didn't like where they were. They knew they were on the worst submarine. Then when they left the ship, they would take their hats and kind of hide them so no one, like, they weren't proud okay. of, of the ship. They didn't enjoy it. Every, they, they were all trying to get out of the Navy. Um, they, they, no one wants to be on a losing team. Mm -hmm. And True. they knew my background. They knew I was trained for a different kind of ship. So when I admitted I didn't know, it was actually a moment of honesty that actually made it better for us. We trusted each other more because now they could say they didn't know. Uh -huh. They start, they, so, so we stopped playing this game where I pretend like I know the answers, but you pretend like you know the answers and it's all bullshit. Yeah. So, so I said, I, I had this moment. Anyway, I, I said to the guys, hey, look, how about I stop telling you guys what to do and you tell me. Oh, so, so you had this conversation. Yeah, yeah, we had a conversation. Okay. And the, we, were, we were all about permission. Okay. This is the way the Navy was structured. Every, everybody who wanted to do something would come up to their boss and get permission. permission. What permission means... The answer is no, unless everybody says yes. Mm. So, so even, so Tony, I say, oh, I, I want to start, I want to do, um, I want to start a new curriculum for how we, for G4. For G4. Okay. And, but you're busy. I can't get, a, I need your permission. I can't get a hold of you. I can't get on your schedule. It's two months from now, whatever. So not what happens? Nothing. We don't do it. But if we run the company with intent, that was our magic word. So intent in English for my team meant you're going to do it unless you hear no. So if you don't hear anything. Mm -hmm. So if I say, I send you an email, Tony, hey, I'm working on this curriculum, da, da 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 I intend to do a pilot program, blah, 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 blah. It's gonna take this much resources. And you look at that email and you're like, okay, you just delete it. Yeah. You delete, or you're busy. I'm or, aware. Or you're on a vacation, uh -huh. you, so you know about it. So yeah. that's the first thing. You have a chance to vote. You can, you can veto, you can say no, hold off, or come talk to me. And we'll, hey, how's this aligned mm -hmm. with what our, with, with our brand or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. You can ask all the questions you want. Mm -hmm. And I don't get upset. I don't say, oh, well, don't you trust me? Why are you asking me these questions? <laughs> like, I expose my thinking. I say, hey, make, make my thinking stronger. Let, let me bounce this off you. Here's what I'm thinking. Here's why I'm thinking. Here's why we decided this, blah, blah, blah. And so you can go any of those options, including just ignoring it. But it still happens. But here's the key. I can't later say, oh, well, you know, this is a bad idea, but Tony told me to do it. Like we know Wells Fargo, Boeing 737 Max, Volkswagen engineers. Yeah. So that only happens because people are being told what to do. Mm -hmm. An organization where people come up with the ideas on their own, they're not gonna, we can't go and get 200 engineers to do a bad thing with the diesel engine. It comes from one person on top and a culture where people have to do what they're told. Exactly. They do as they told. Yeah, and we know. We'll say, we don't want it. We'll, we'll say, like a lot of our clients, like the CEO comes to me and says, I, you know, I wish people would stop just doing what they're told. I want them to, I want to hear from them. And, uh, but we know people will do what they're told even when they know it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Study after study after study after study. And here's the thing, every once in a while, someone will say, well, wait a minute. And then we get evidence that people are speaking up. But we, we never get the evidence when people didn't speak up. So the evidence in our brain is like, oh, like it's I, 10 times in the last two years, people spoke up and zero times. Yeah, but you don't know, probably 200. So you don't know the evidence and The key is, there's a, there's, a, there's a couple tricks. Number one is, don't wait for them to start speaking up for you to stop telling them what to do. You, the, the first step is you stop telling them what to do. 
then they will start speaking up. Because there will be, a, I mean, I, I imagine that at first they'll be a little bit lost. Yeah, they're, yeah. But or I, confused. I would, like I would tell them and say, look, but you know, like you engage. Don't just like walk out the door and say, oh, you guys run the thing from now on. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, but you got to do this in step by step. So okay. we, have a, we have a structure. It's called the ladder of leadership. But the idea is when someone comes to you, you don't tell them what to do. You, you get them talking about what they see, what they would like to do, what they think they should do, what they would, you know, what they intend to do. And you yeah. kind of just step them up. That way you move it, it's, you move from low ownership to high ownership, but you move from safe. It, the safest place to be is just be told what to do. Yeah. So this, all this discussion about workplace psychological safety is happening now because we want people to move into the thinking space. Mm-hmm. If, I, if I just want a team to do what they tell, I wouldn't care about psychological safety. Exactly. It's easy, just do what you're told. I don't yeah. care. You're just a machine, right? You're a machine. A means to an end. You're a machine to me. And why? So, and and we see it in the language. So in English, in English, we have all hands meetings. Uh huh. So I went to a tech company, spoke at their conference. It was an all hands conference. So this is a tech company. Mm -hmm. Their hands are like the least useful part of their body. That what they're using are their brains to code products. But we don't say all heads or all hearts. We still say all hands because the language is anchored in that time in, 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 the, in the Industrial Revolution when we hired people for their hands. Mm-hmm. And so if you hire people, I do the thinking, you do the doing. Yeah. I don't, like, I'll pretend I care about you, but I really don't care about you because you don't need to be emotionally stable to just sit there and do widgets all day long. If I say, well, are we doing the right widgets? Are we building the right kind of car? Is there a way to make the process better? Now, I better care about what kind of a day you had because you can't be at your best. Mm -hmm. You won't have the ideas. True. And and, I mean, we, we try to do that in, in, in G4 because we, we, we come from, from a culture, you know, that uh, decentralized decision making, yeah. you know, and all that. So reading, reading your book was, was very insightful uh, because, you know, it was like, we kind of do that already. Yeah, you were like, yeah. But, but one thing that, that struck me was exactly the, the, the psychological part, the language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? This really struck me. Because we, we say, you know, no, we're, we, we're not, you know, a, a very, um, we like people to think by themselves, yeah. make decisions and all that. But when, when it comes to language, and I started paying attention to, to the language that I used and the, the leadership team used, yeah. it's still, let's say, old fashioned, right? Still. Yeah, so... Um, it's really hard to change. Exa- exactly. So I'll, gi- so I'll give you an example. Um, a couple examples. Someone comes to you and says, hey, I'd like to um, change the marketing plan. I, like, I, I want to change the website. Mm-hmm. And we ask questions, but the questions are, tend to be things like, is it going to work? Is it safe? Are you sure? So these are all binary, que- they're yes, no answers. They're binary questions. Yeah. And the problem with those questions are, those questions were good in the industrial age when someone was just a machine worker. But now it's about thinking, it's like, well, I don't know. I can't say 100% it's gonna work, but maybe 60, I, like, I don't know, but we, so, and then we say, oh, well, you didn't tell me. So we always like to say, start the question with the word what or how. So we say, how sure, how sure are you? 50%, okay, 95%, 5%. And I don't, I don't worry about whether it's, oh, is that 92 or 94, uh-huh. whatever. Yeah. So it's like, when you say 95, I, I got a sense that you have a lot of, but, but it also gives people permission to say, hey, I got, I got a question. I'm only 5% sure about this, but if we're wrong, people are going to die, like 737 max. So, so what happens is when you raise your hand and say, hey, let's not do the product release, 
And then it turns out that whatever you're worried about was, was fine. Uh -huh. the, every audience I, I talk to, we'll try this tomorrow, we'll see. Uh -huh. Every audience will say, oh, well, they were wrong. In other words, me stopping the process over a concern that turned to be unfounded is wrong. Now that's a problem. The, the fact that we say it's wrong means, oh, I don't want to be wrong, so we'll put a, it's a bad word. So it reduces the ability of people to do that. We could call it, say, resilience. Okay. We could call it agility. We could call it, uh, in, in the Navy, we would say a questioning attitude. Uh, in the oil industry, they call it a chronic sense of unease. It, it, when you're dealing with high pressure, high, where people can die, you, you shouldn't be complacent. You shouldn't be too comfortable. You always need to sort of, is it, okay, is that right? What's really going on here? And then we see we have accidents when people stop doing that. But this language, we're programmed in a certain, in, in, and I'm going to I'm going to show the group tomorrow. Uh -huh. They'll see and the way they run meetings, for example. They're all going to do the same thing. I guarantee it. And I'll, like, I'll, okay, I'll just yeah. So this is coming out later. So yeah. So here's the deal. You can see. So let's. So they're sitting, they're sitting at tables, which uh -huh. I love. Yep. And I'll give give them a problem. I'll say, at your table, come up with the, come up with something like, uh, what will be the price of, gas uh, oil on the last day of the year, or what's the population of some country. And, but you all have to agree. How's it going to work? What happens? Someone will say something. Oh, well, I think it's 100. Well, no, I think it's 90. No, I think it's 110. Blah, 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 blah. So a little argument, and then we'll sign it to settle. But what happened, because we did it that way, the first person to speak anchors the group. We mm. don't get 20. We don't get 200. So what you, and, and, and the structure that structure is inherently coercive and it reduces variability. So what you want to do is say, hey, everybody take a note card, write it, write down your guess and slide it in the middle of the table. Then let's flip them all up. Now people, we aren't anchored. Mm -hmm. And then I look at the high and the low. I say, oh, someone's got a thousand. Let's hear, <laughs> let's hear from them. Tony, tell us, not like what were you thinking, but like tell, yeah, this is it. That, let's talk about that. How could that be? So, so, so we had to relearn all these structures because without thinking about it, all these conversations were anchored in an industrial age structure. And I, I can't tell you how many companies we go to where they've done a reorg and people are now tribes instead of Squad teams or uh -huh. squads and we, we we label things different but the meetings are run the same way yeah and and they're not getting the benefit they don't realize the degree to which they've been programmed and they're not getting the benefits that they want it's not that they're not trying to be decentralized of with course. community of effort and give people the ability to make decisions they are desperately but they haven't gone basic enough and the words that we say, you got to get to that level. If you can't, the, uh, the example we use is sometimes we do executive teams. I give them this exercise. I say, step one, I want a culture that is fill in the blank. Uh -huh. And people will say, I mean, all the usual uh, collaborative, inclusive, uh, a bias for action, yeah. a sense of urgency. Um, risk embracing, um, innovate, whatever it is. I said, okay, great. Now let's pick one. And let's say collaborative. I want a culture that is collaborative. And I say, I want you to imagine you're writing a TV show mm -hmm. about your company where you got the camera and the camera's at watching some meeting. What would you have those people say to convince the audience watching the show that it's a collaborative culture. So now you have to put words in people's mouths. Uh -huh. And that's the power of the words is we can practice them and we can measure them. And it's the, and so I say, great, now that you have those words, just start practicing those words in meetings. And when they do that, their brains will then reconnect and then it will feel, it will become collaborative. 
the language leads the feeling. We act our way to new thinking. And this is why most change programs don't work is because it tries to do the opposite. We try to say, well, imagine we were the most collaborative place on the planet, blah, blah, blah. Now, good luck with that. Go out there and just do something <laughs> different. Well, what does that mean? I don't know. What the hell? What do I, how does it sound? I don't know. And so, and it's really hard to write those scripts, but that's where the value is. And then you just practice those words. Perfect. You said, you said something to me when we were talking there um, at, the, uh, at the venue. Um, uh, and, and I think this is also very important for, for the, the role of the leader uh, is clarity, mm -hmm. right? Um, what, what do you say about, because sometimes people come asking you for guidance or something. Yeah. And if you have this approach of, you know, not telling them what to do, It might, it might, you know, it's confusing, right? Yeah, it might, yeah, yeah, it might yeah. give them a, an impression that it's not clear what he wants me to do. Right. Because he told me to figure out what to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? right. How, how do you work okay, that? Okay, so <clears throat> you're building a new product. The team comes to, they got to make a decision. Mm -hmm. uh, we're making a car. It's going to have three wheels or four. So they come in to your office. They say, hey, boss, um, we got to make a decision with three wheels or four. Four. Like, you're, if, they, if they phrase the question that way, you're probably going to give them the answer. Yeah. Uh, what I want you to do is don't think about the solution yet. Think about the criteria of, like, what does success look like? And I would say, okay, well, before we talk about three or four wheels, let me just talk about what we're trying to do with this car. We call it, it's an intent statement. So sorry, it's what an intent intent. So okay. we're giving, so we give intent, not instructions. If I say make a car with four wheels, I'm giving instructions. So yeah. I say, I want you to make a car. It's obviously got to be, um, stable and it's got to sit within the existing infrastructure. Three wheels. There's probably there's, it's a little simpler and it's probably a little cheaper because you only need to buy three tires instead of four. But I can see a lot of downsides to a three-wheeled um, car. They have them in India a lot. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, but, but so and the other so so give them the thinking. Give them your thought process, and really try. And then say, so go now, go. Let me know what you guys think. And don't say come back next year. Uh -huh. Just like go. Just sit over here. I'm order some pizza sit over here for an hour and then come back and let me know what you guys think. Like, but let them grapple with so, it. So the clarity comes from the intent, the, the, the intention. Yes. The, the intent is what we're trying to achieve. We say we give intent, not instructions to the team. And the team comes back with how they intend to fulfill mm. that vision. So for example, I would say my, an intent statement on the submarine might be, Uh, we have been assigned to recover a SEAL team, which will be, be at a certain location. Success will be judged upon the following. Mm -hmm. Are we in right position? Or do I say, did we actually pick up the SEAL team? Because if I say us being in the right position, but the SEAL team's out of position, the SEALs are the special forces guys. Yeah, And so uh -huh. they're, they're out of, so, oh, well, look, I was, I was in the right place. Screw those guys. <laughs> like, no, I, we need to go get them. But what if, What if they're in the wrong position, but the position is dangerous for the submarine? So now I'm going to pick up 12 people, but I have 140 people. I'm going to put at risk. Well, how much risk? So now you can have all these conversations like, well, how much risk is too much risk? And we want to remain undetected and that kind of thing. I'm not going to risk a submarine mm -hmm. for 12 people. I mean, it's, they know that. So we have to make it safe. They have to be in a position, place where it's safe for us to surface and get them. So, so, but you can't have these conversations. But when you do have these conversations, you're building leaders. You're building people who can think. You're building people who, like, if you're sick one day, or you're on vacation, you're skiing, or you just didn't feel like answering your phone, they're going to still do Your it. Your team know how to make the yeah, decision. Yeah, they can still. Here's another thing. For leaders, try this. Come into a meeting five minutes late. Like, if you're the boss... Just come five minutes late and see what happens. 
And they're all sitting around, oh, we're just waiting on you. Your team's not, your team's not doing well. Yeah. You're not in a good place. So I would talk about it and I might say, hey, I'm going to be five minutes late. Start without me. Yeah. And you, if you have a deputy, maybe you give them a heads up and say, hey, just start without or just see what happens. I want yeah. you know, put an observer in. Yeah. And just say, hey, just watch what happens. Who talks? And then when you show up, just go sit in the back and say, hey, you guys sound like you got you know, Keep going. Because the whole thing is you're going to be gone eventually. Yeah. It might be. That, that's actually the idea, right? Yeah. 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 That's right. You want to be gone. Yeah. Go start a new company. Exactly. Go retire, retire. spend time with your family, do nothing. I don't care. Yeah. But eventually you're going to be dead. (laughs) Even Elon Musk will eventually be dead. So we, leadership is a journey toward obsolescence. I love that. It's like parenting. If by the time your kids are 18, they're leaving the house. If you... Like that was your chance to embed your sense of values and the sense of character and doing the right thing in them. Yeah. But you can't, after that, they're out. They're at uni- university or they're doing their thing and you, you, you don't want to be watching them all the time. So you, you, you shouldn't be parenting when your kid is 30. Yeah, can you tell my parents that? <laughs> I had this heart. <laughs> anyway, I yeah. So it's a it's a journey towards obsolete, and and that making yourself obsolete doesn't feel good. Yeah, it 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 feels like I'm extinguishing the flame of my ego or something. It feels like you're not doing your work. Yeah, but for me, uh, it's. As, as I'm getting older, it feels really good because now I don't look at my garage and say, oh, look, you know, I have a Lexus and a Jaguar. How successful am I? I get phone calls from people who work for me who say, you believed in me. I started my own company. You believed in me. I'm the first person in my family to go to college. You believed in me. You, you, I, hey, I just got selected to be submarine commander on and on and on and maybe it, I didn't feel this way when I was 30 I would never have said something like this uh-huh. but now I just think that that that's just a lot more important and it matters more and it just gives me a sense of of comfort uh-huh. and I uh, one of the questions sometimes we ask people is imagine you get an email you wake up you have your coffee, you get an email, emails from God. God <laughs> says, today's your last day. Oh, wow. Um, you're, I'm taking you at the end of today. And like, what are you going to be thinking about? Uh-huh. What are you going to do? And I'm pretty sure you're not going to be thinking about your Lexus. <laughs> nope. You don't care about it anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's gone. Like yeah. that stuff doesn't, like it, it, it doesn't work. Or, or to make, or just like you find out that you got cancer, like you have uh-huh. cancer, you have a death sentence. You just you have cancer. I think you got four months. You have pancreatic cancer, like Steve Jobs had. Uh-huh. What are you gonna do? All that other crap becomes unimportant. Yeah, and it's kind of a brutal exercise, but I think it's worth thinking about. Yeah, and and as you said, making the difference in the lives of people who who you helped is very fulfilling. Right. Well, that's the whole point of an education company, I would exactly. think. <laughs> I, was going, I was going to get there. That's, yeah. that's exactly our... Uh, we have a, a BHAG. You probably heard of a yeah, BHAG sure, sure, sure. Yeah. And ours is by 2030, we want to help our customers, our students, sure. uh, to generate in, 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 you know, in total, to generate 1 million new jobs. So we're teaching entrepreneurs, we're teaching uh, yeah. business leaders so that they can uh, create more jobs. Yeah, so now you're helping right. people help more people who exactly. are going to help more people. And so you have these ripples that just go out and exactly. we just... Yeah. And this is why um, I'm optimistic about the future. I, 
So my, my dad, who's in his 80s now, and he kind of gets like, oh, like there's going to be no jobs and robots. And he, he kind of, and, and I was like, look, look what's going on, though. Like the world is safer because of all, yeah. and uh, the medicine, and on and on and on. And, and life hum- expectancy. Life expectancy. And humans are freed from a lot of the, the drudgery. Yeah. Like, the lot, the lot, a lot of the worst jobs, the most toxic jobs, jobs that have killed us. Um, not everywhere, not all at once, but we're we're getting away from that. Yeah. And I and this, I think once we start unlocking everybody's brain power, we've been in this period where we using everybody's hands. But we're only using a few people's brains. Yeah. And the people who's using their brains, they're happy. They're like, oh yeah, I could use my oh, play games or whatever. Like people like to use their brains. Yeah. And but they don't have all the answers. Nope. There's no way they can have all the answers. They like some committee in Brussels isn't gonna figure out the right climate approach for Brazil. Exactly. They might think they can. But they can't. So, I mean, there's so many local things, like with the culture and the geography and the Amazon, the rainforest, and all this stuff that we need everybody to solve those problems. We need everybody thinking to solve those problems. Yeah. Great. Uh, David, I, I, I'm very, very happy with this conversation. Uh, I think um, it was very insightful at least for me, I'm trying to, to apply this, you know, uh, uh, more decentralized decision making yeah. at, at, at my company, at the team. I hope that, you know, who, who is watching us got some of those insights as well. What would you say uh, for someone who is, uh, let's say, starting on the leadership role? Yeah. A little bit like, like you did yeah. when, when, I mean, you were already a leader, yeah. but you had to shift your style, your leadership style, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And this is very much the, 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 the case with most of our students. They are already, uh, they already own a company. They have, you know, 30, 40, 50 people on yeah. their team. Yeah. But in order to get to the next level, yeah. they need to reinvent themselves. Yes. What would you give them as a, as a you know, top one I'll, advice? Yeah. So, other than, of course, reading your book. Okay, yeah. So read my book, turn the ship around. Thank you. But you got to start with yourself. And so, one of the first activities we do with our um, the CEOs that we're coaching uh-huh. is we have them um, when they go to a restaurant, they can't order, they can't tell the server what they want. They need to get the server to choose for them. Oh, wow. Uh, if you're like in a buffet line, you get the person behind you to pick. Now, you can tell them things like, hey, I don't eat meat or I'm allergic to peanuts. I mean, you, so that's providing clarity. But leadership is a, it's a practice. It's a behavior. It's like football. It's not like history class. It's not theor- abstract and theoretical. You have to do it. So we, we give people exercises to do. And so you go and you do it five. So, so, so you're saying it's an ability. It's an ability. Yeah. yeah, it's a skill. It's a skill. It's a skill you learn and you can practice and you can get better and you can measure it. So can I get that person? Can I empower that person to make this decision for me? Well, if you can't do it in a restaurant, you think you're going to do it at work no. where profits and your net worth and jobs? Ma- no. You, so you got to start in a place that's very safe. And uh, you're changing the scripts because m- most restaurants in the United States, they'll either say, what do you want? You order. Or you might say, well, what do you recommend? And they'll say, oh, the, the fish looks really good today. And they say, okay, I'll have fish. But I want you to go one step further, which is, look, I'll know what it is when you put it in front of me. And this is going to require you to connect with a person. It's, and the whole trick to this is you'll have some sense of unease, but the whole trick is their unease, getting them to choose. Because they're going to be like, oh, you know, you're going to, no, 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 just tell me. I don't want a bad review. 
I don't know how much you want to spend, blah, 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 blah. So you have to make it safe for them. So it's an exercise in connecting with the person so they feel safe to make this decision for you. And I can tell you, this is exactly how I felt every day as a submarine commander. It's the closest thing I can come up with. If you don't, if you never go out, then give up control. People do things like, oh, pick the next book for me to read. You, so you pick book for me. Uh -huh. You pick where we're gonna go on vacation. You pick my next car. You, and you can do this with your family members. It, it's, it, I mean, I wouldn't go to a stranger and say pick the next car, but <laughs> you know, someone who knows you. Uh -huh. uh, but practice giving up control oh, in, wow. a, contr in, in a controlled way. Uh -huh. And do that for a month. And, and for this dining thing, the thing I, I think is really great is because you can try it at different kinds of restaurants. Uh -huh. You can try it, uh, for example, I just landed here in Brazil, so I could try it here. So it's a foreign- A different culture. Different culture, different foods. Um, I'm jet lagged, I'm tired, you know. So that, how does that affect how I am willing to give up control? And so now you need to learn that about yourself. Okay, if I haven't really slept right, I'm probably not gonna be very good and empowering my team today. So maybe I should just stay out of the, <laughs> but like you need to know that about yourself and then you can work on it. So start with yourself, practice giving up control. Don't do anything at work, just practice giving up control in your personal life. Just keep a journal, sense how you feel about it, sense other people's reactions, say, well, hey, how was that for you? Like, what, what did you think when I walked in here and like, and just, have those conversations and then start doing it at work. And it's pretty much the same thing at work, right? It feels, the, yeah. I, and it, it will feel more natural. It, yeah, but it feels the same. The okay. feelings, like when I say, okay, you, you choose for me. Uh -huh. For me, I get a mixture of nervousness. Yeah. Because like, I don't know, I, I picked up something I really don't like. But it's also excitement because it's like, well, maybe they're going to pick They'll, I've been, they pick stuff not even on the menu. Like, oh, you know what? We got to, I got, sit here. We got amazing food coming out for you. And those are the best days. Yeah, I believe it. <laughs> nice. Thank you so much, David. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I, I'm really looking forward for, for your class tomorrow. I mean, you gave a little bit of a yeah. spoiler. You can here. skip it. You, I got, you already got everything. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'll be there. I, I'll, I'll make sure I'll sit on a table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll take, I, I won't, I won't cheat. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, no, that's just, <laughs> just watch what happens. Yeah, yeah. I'll watch. I'll, I'll participate. But it's been a pleasure uh, talking to you. Uh, and I'm really looking forward for tomorrow. Um, if you haven't, read uh, Turn the Ship Around yet. It's an, an amazing book. I think you should read it. Uh, and, you know, I, I hope you, you enjoy your stay here as well. I hope you enjoy the, the chat here and I hope you enjoy tomorrow. And maybe, you know, who knows, you come back uh, in another opportunity so that we can keep uh, teaching about leadership to, to our uh, entrepreneurs here in Brazil. We're in a place right now that we really need to step up our, our uh, how to say, our power to, our ability yeah. to empower people. Yeah, right? I, I, I'm super optimistic. I think Brazil is kind of, we like, need to start punching we are. up here. And you have a big um, population. Yeah. So you can, so this is one of the benefits of the United States is LinkedIn grows in the United States then and up. then they go over to sea and then there's LinkedIn Germany or whoever invented the, they can't compete. Nope. So you have this big population and you can build um, products here that win and then they go out over the world. But you've already built, you got big, yeah. big, um, lots of wealth and people here so you can learn and you can build products and you can help and even if you just stay in Brazil, yeah. you'll be plenty rich. We have we have a few players uh, like this in Brazil already, like yeah. fintechs or ban even banks. Yep, yep, yep. And and, and you know uh, uh, companies there are, are Brazilian companies who are acquiring American uh, startups and American companies. So exactly, I mean we 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 are very privileged on this. Thank you so much, David. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Pessoal, acabei de bater um papo aqui incrível. 
com o David Marquer, né? ele que vai ser nosso professor aqui do G4 Class, da sétima edição do G4 Class. É, estamos aqui com 150 membros, ele vai dar uma aula é, amanhã para esses membros sobre liderança, falar um pouquinho do que a gente conversou aqui, trazer esse, essa metodologia, esse framework que ele tem de liderança para os nossos membros. E continua acompanhando a gente aí, o G4 Podcasts, segue a gente lá, me segue também, Tony Celestino, e a gente vai estar tá dando para vocês aí mais um, um... Vamos fazer vários recortes dessa, desse podcast aqui para que você possa acompanhar todo esse conteúdo e vamos também estar anunciando aí quem serão nossos próximos convidados. Obrigado aí pela audiência de todo mundo. Até a próxima edição. Valeu. Obrigado.